The RVM, blessed to share in the journey of faith in the 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines. The Congregation of the Religious of the Virgin Mary joins in the celebration of the 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines in joy and thanksgiving for the gift of Catholic faith in our country. The history of the RVM congregation is very much connected with the history of the Christianization of the Philippines. This year, 2021, marks the 337th year of the existence of the RVM congregation, formerly the Beaterio de la Compañía de Jesús, founded in Intramuros, Manila, by a native Chinese mestiza, Mother Ignacia del Spiritu Santo. Who are we, the religious of the Virgin Mary? What is our story? How have we been blessed by and shared in the evangelizing mission of the church? I am Sister Maria Anicia Vico RVM, Consultor for Formation and Vocation and Directress of the Mother Ignacia Center for Spirituality. This is our story. The growth of the RVM and its missions from the foundational community of Mother Ignacia del Spirito Santo to the present through more than three centuries is a story that spans four historical periods. The first, 1684 to 1748, Mother Ignacia del Spirito Santo and the Beaterio de la Compañía de Jesús. The second, 1748 to 1898, the Beaterio de la Compañía de Jesús, survival, challenges, and missionary developments. The third, 1899 to 1948, transitioning from Beaterio to a pontifical congregation, the religious of the Virgin Mary. And the fourth, 1948 to 2021, the RVMs at the service of mission in the native country and overseas. The first historical period, 1684 to 1748, Mother Ignacia del Spiritu Santo and the Beaterio de la Compañía de Jesús. The foundress of the religious of the Virgin Mary Mother Ignacia del Spiritu Santo was born, lived, and died during the Spanish colonial era in the Philippines. The few primary sources and historical documents available yield enough information to reconstruct the story of Mother Ignacia and the community she founded, the Beaterio de la Compañía de Jesús, now known as the Congregation of the Religious of the Virgin Mary. The precise date of her birth is not known, but her baptismal record shows the date and place of her baptism, the name of her parents and godparent, and the priest who baptized her. Her parents, Josepe Yuko, a Chinese convert to Catholicism in 1652, and Maria Jeronima, a native, were residents of Binondo, the place where the Chinese Catholics were settled by the Spaniards to separate them from the non-Catholic Chinese. Because of the threat of the invasion by the Chinese pirates in 1662, the church in Binondo was demolished together with the other stone structures, convents, and churches in Manila upon the order of the Spanish governor general so that they could not be used as bastion of defense or offense by the Chinese pirates in case of attack. Thus, Giuseppe and Maria Jeronima 
brought their first child to the Holy King's Church in Parian, where she received the sacrament of baptism from Fray Alberto Collares. At her baptism, she was given the name Ignacia del Spiritu Santo. The significance of this name would become manifest in the course of her life. The historical context in which Ignacia grew up was characterized by conflicts and discrimination. Every now and then, there were conflicts between the governor general and the archbishop, and some conflicts among the religious orders. The society which Ignacia knew was a colonial pyramid. At the top of the society were the Spaniards who came to the country from Spain, the Peninsulares. They considered themselves to be the legitimate inhabitants of the islands and held top government positions. Next in rank were the Spaniards born in the islands, Insulares or Creoles. They belonged to the ruling class but were also discriminated against by the Peninsulares. Below these ranks were the half-breeds, mestizos, mestizas, and the natives, Indios, Indias. As a Chinese India mestiza, Ignacia became aware of the ambivalent attitude of the Spaniards toward the Chinese. They praised the Chinese for their industry and contribution to the economy, but treated them with suspicion and taxed them heavily. The natives, on the other hand, were engaged to work for the Spaniards and their interests. Some were subjected to forced labor in the shipyard of Cavite and other places as well. Others were recruited as sailors and trained to fight with the Spaniards against any invading force. The roles of men and women in the society were delineated. For women and girls, Social acceptability meant developing characteristics of shyness, discretion, restraint, and timidity. Ignacia grew up as an only child from age six because her siblings, Rafaela, Santiago, and Juana de la Concepcion all died in infancy. She learned her first prayers from her mother who also taught her the basic tenets of the Catholic faith and the practice of Christian piety. Her faith was nurtured in the family. With her parents, Ignacia followed the practices of piety common during her time, praying the rosary and other devotions, particularly devotions to the Blessed Virgin Mary, joining processions, assisting at Mass, receiving Holy Communion, and going to a confession. Like the other native and mestizo or mestiza children, Ignacia received education in the parish, which was mostly doctrinal. Although there were already two educational institutions for women and girls, Santa Potenciana, established in 1595, and Santa Isabel in 1632, these were reserved for Spanish girls and women. In 1684, when Ignacia was 21 years old, her parents wanted her to marry. She felt there could be another way of life for her. She desired to dedicate her whole life to God. Torn between the desire to please her parents and to follow the steerings deep within her heart, she went to make a general confession and seek the advice of Father Paul Klein, a Jesuit priest from Bohemia, who arrived in Manila in 1682 and became known by his Hispanized name, Pablo Klein. Father Klein gave her the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola to help her discern the will of God for her. After this retreat, she went home to tell her parents about her decision to remain in the service of the Divine Majesty and live by the sweat of her brow. 
She left home, supported herself by needlework, and lived a life of prayer and penance in the house located at the back of the Jesuit College of Manila. Mother Ignacia centered her life on the suffering Christ and tried to imitate him through a life of service and humility. She prayed earnestly to God and performed penances to beg God's mercy. Her life of prayer and labor attracted other Native women who also felt called to the religious life but could not be admitted into the existing congregation at that time, which only admitted Spanish women. Mother Ignacia accepted these women into her company, and the first community was born. They became known as the Beatas de la Compañía de Jesús because they frequently received the sacraments at the Church of St. Ignatius, performed many acts of devotion there, and had the Jesuit fathers for their spiritual directors and confessors. As they grew in number, they felt the need for a more stable lifestyle and a set of rules. They set down in writing their community practices and drew up their daily schedule. These rules reflect the developing spirituality of Mother Ignacia that she shared with her community. Her spirituality of humble service was expressed in her capacity to forgive, to bear wrongs patiently, and to correct with gentleness and meekness. This spirituality was manifest in peace and harmony in the community, mutual love and union of wills, witnessing to the love of Christ and the maternal care of the Blessed Mother. Mother Ignacia and her companions were involved in retreat work and helped the Jesuit fathers by preparing the retreatants to be disposed to the spiritual exercises. They also admitted young girls as boarders and taught them Christian doctrine, reading, and writing, as well as sewing and household arts and skills. Mother Ignacia did not make any distinction of color or race, but admitted Indias, Mestizas, and Spanish girls to be educated in the Beaterio. She also opened the Beaterio to women even Spanish women, who wanted a place of solitude and stay as recogidas. The Beatas became known for their devotion, humility, application to work, and the spiritual exercises. Encouraged and assisted by the Jesuit fathers, Mother Ignacia finally completed the writing of the rules of the Beaterio which defined their group as a community of religious women. Their rule of life was based on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola and inspired by the spirit and example of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mother Ignatia submitted these rules to the Archdiocesan Office. With the Archdiocese being sede vacante, the fiscal provisor approved the rules in 1732. Sometime after, probably in 1737, Mother Ignacia requested to be relieved of her position as rectora, and the leadership passed on to Sor Dominga del Rosario. The community observed the process of electing the rectora as provided for in the 1726 constitutions and rules. The Beaterio of Mother Ignacia will go down in history as the first group of Filipinos to exercise the right of suffrage through secret ballot. Mother Ignacia lived the rest of her life in the Beaterio as an ordinary member without seeking honor or privilege as the foundress of the community. Murillo Velarde saw in this act of relinquishing her position of superior of the house 
as a sign of her great humility. Mother Ignacia did not cling to power and privilege. All she wanted was to serve God in humble service. Murillo Villarde described her as so humble, a truly strong woman, mortified, patient, devout, spiritual, zealous for the good of souls. Two months before Mother Ignacia's death, the Archbishop initiated a process of securing the royal protection for the Beatario. The Archbishop wrote his letter to the king based on the report of the visitation of the Beatario. The letter reached Spain only two years after. On September 10, 1748, Mother Ignacia died without knowing the response of the Spanish king to the petition of the Archbishop. But she left behind a community that was in expectant hope for what the future might hold for them, trusting always in God's providence as Mother Ignacia taught them by example. Murillo Villarde observed the honor and acknowledgement given to Mother Ignacia by the civil and church leaders who carried her coffin during her funeral. The contribution of Mother Ignacia and her community, the Beatas de la Campania de Jesus, may be summarized in the following. Mother Ignacia and her companions gave witness to a way of living the Christian faith during their time. Mother Ignacia's life manifests the working of God's grace that enabled her to persevere through many difficulties. By God's grace, she was able to form, lead, nurture, and sustain a community of Native women to live a life of total consecration to God. Mother Ignacia and the Beatario are the fruits of the grace of God and the evangelizing efforts of the missionaries. Mother Ignacia and her companions shared their faith as they involved themselves in helping in the retreats conducted by the Jesuit fathers, in teaching the young the basics of Catholic faith and the rudiments of reading, writing, and household arts, and in providing a place for women to spend some time in solitude and prayer. The Beatario of Mother Ignacia will go down in history as the first group of Filipinos to exercise the right of suffrage through secret ballot. Thus, the community of Mother Ignacia contributed to the society and the church through the promotion of literacy, culture, and education, as well as evangelization. The second historical period, 1748 to 1898, the Beatario de la Campania de Jesus, Survival, Challenges, and Missionary Developments. Seven years after the death of Mother Ignacia, the Beatario learned from the Archbishop the response of the King of Spain to his letter. King Ferdinand VI's decree of royal protection dated November 25, 1755, officially acknowledged the Beatario, but explicitly defined it as a secular association. The King ordained that the house or Beateria of Native women continue to enjoy its present status, supporting itself without, however, becoming a convent or a foundation, but only a house of retreat exempt from cloister. Said women and other persons living with them in the house are not to be molested in the practice of their pious exercises. The decree ensured the safety of the residents of the Beatario, but it denied the nature of the Beatario as a community of religious women. 
A year later, the king required a report on the statutes of the Beaterio. The royal cedula of 1761 ordered the Beaterio to be placed under the direct supervision of the governor general and to formulate a new constitution that would define it as a secular institution. The Jesuit provincial who was asked to assist the Beatas in formulating the new constitutions clarified that the Jesuits did not exercise any authority over these Beatas who are seculars and their voluntary pronouncement of the simple vows as approved by their confessors does not violate the law. What the Beatas did was simply to mark with asterisk the numbers in the 1726 constitutions and rules that the king ordered to be deleted. Even without being recognized as religious women, the Beatas continued to live the religious life according to the spirit and charism of Mother Ignacia del Spirito Santo. When the Jesuits were expelled from the Philippines, the Beatas lost their spiritual fathers, directors, and confessors. The 1767 decree of King Charles II of Spain ordering the expulsion of the Jesuits from all his dominions, including the Philippines, was immediately executed when it reached the Philippines in 1768. Thus, from 1768 until the return of the Jesuits to the Philippines in 1859, the Beaterio thrived on its own and continued the retreat work even without the Jesuit priests. The Beatas were not totally without support because they enjoyed the solicitude of the Archbishop and other church men who helped and supported them even in their retreat works. The Beatas carried on the education and formation of young girls in the Beaterio and offered hospitality to women who wanted a temporary place of seclusion and solitude. Even with these apostolic works, the Beaterio had to deal with the demand of the king to keep them from developing as a religious community. In order to satisfy the king, the Beatas produced in 1795 a copy of their constitutions with a note, Expurgado Según el Edicto de 1747, on its cover. The 1795 constitutions, however, was exactly the same as the 1726 constitutions and rules of Mother Ignacia. The numbers that indicate the religious character of the Beaterio were not deleted, but only marked with asterisks. The succeeding rectoras of the Beaterio were keen in ensuring that the Beaterio retain its original nature according to the spirit and vision of Mother Ignacia. The continuing support of the Archbishop, who did not fail to send a delegate to preside over the election of the rectoras of the Beaterio and to make the necessary appointments of officials when the need arose was a tacit approval and recognition of the nature and importance of this Beaterio. The Beaterio, which reached its 166 years of existence since its foundation, was recognized as a teaching institution in 1850 in Bocetas Diccionario Geográfico Estadístico Histórico de las Islas Filipinas, in the weekly publication La Ilustración Filipina in 1860. Its September issue featured the Beateria of Mother Ignacia among the Beaterios de Manila under the title Educandas del Beaterio. The Beatas managed to keep the retreat movement going by inviting available priests to give the retreat and helping in explaining the points and translating them for the native women. 
In 1874, about 15 years after the return of the Jesuits to the Philippines, the Jesuits were given the Mindanao missions and had already run some slave children in Tamontaka, appealed to the Beaterio for help to take care of the girls. Three recogidas volunteered to go to the missions. They begged the rectora to be invested with the holy habit and the grace to be missionaries in Mindanao. These three became the first missionaries to Mindanao of the Beaterio of Mother Ignacia. They were given charge of the girls in Tamuntaka, Cotabato, while the Jesuits took care of the boys. The Beatas taught reading and writing, as well as household arts of sewing, washing, and ironing clothes, even farming. The spiritual and religious formation of the Beatas were taken care of by the Jesuits. The missionary life of the Beatas in Tamuntaka inspired some Beatas in Manila to volunteer for the Mindanao missions. Soon, Beaterios were opened in places where the Jesuits had their missions in the Pitan, Dipolog, Zamboanga, and Butuan. The Beatas distinguished themselves in educating young girls and pioneered the retreat movement in these areas. The rise of the mission Beaterios in Mindanao posed a problem to the Beaterio in Manila. When an article was published in La Ilustración Filipina in 1893 that featured Mother Ignacia del Espíritu Santo and the work of the Beatas in Manila and in Mindanao, the status of the Beaterio in Manila was questioned. Since it was not canonically a religious institute, it could not have daughter foundations. The matter was resolved by requiring the Beatas going to the Mindanao Mission to renounce their membership to the Beaterio in Manila. The Beaterios in Tamantaka and the Pitan were to be independent Beaterios and were allowed to admit novices and train them for religious profession of vows. Even with these conditions, some Beatas from Manila still volunteered to go to Mindanao. They renounced their membership to the Manila Beaterio and the right to return to it. At the outbreak of the Philippine Revolution against Spain in 1896, the Beatas in Manila saw the danger of their staying in the Beaterio in Intramuros. The former Jesuit establishment across the street had become a Spanish barracks since the Jesuit expulsion. Only in 1898, when the American forces arrived, did the Beatas evacuate the Beaterio upon the order of the Archbishop. The Beatas moved to Malabon, then to Apaumbong and Hagonoy. Wherever they went, they gathered the little children and taught them. Some of the Beatas went along with General Emilio Aguinaldo's army and ministered to the wounded soldiers. They not only acted as nurses, but also gave good counsel and encouragement to the soldiers. For these services, General Aguinaldo expressed his immense gratitude to the Beaterio when the war was over. The mission Beaterios of Mother Ignacia was the way to the fulfillment of the dreams of native women in Mindanao long before Ignacia was born. Clara and Isabel Kalima of Butuan and Maria Uray of the Pitan wished to belong to a religious community of women, but they did not have that opportunity. They lived and died as solitary Beatas. The troubled times did not prevent the Beatas from carrying out their mission of sharing their faith, not only by teaching children and helping in retreat, but also by nursing the sick and wounded and giving consolation to people who were in sorrow and affliction. The Beatas also became part of the shaping of the Filipino identity. The third historical period, 1899 to 1948, 
transitioning from Beaterio to a pontifical congregation, the religious of the Virgin Mary. When the lives of the Jesuit missionaries and the Beatas were endangered because of the coming of the revolutionaries from Manila, the Jesuits decided to evacuate the Beatas and the children from Tamontaca. The children were distributed to some families and the Beatas of Tamontaca, Zamboanga, and the Pitan, together with the Jesuit missionaries, sailed to Manila in 1899. Upon the request of the Jesuit superior of the Mindanao mission, the Archbishop allowed the Mindanao Beatas to occupy the Beaterio, which was turned into a hospital by the Spaniards and were now taken over by the American army. In 1900, when the Manila Beatas who evacuated the Beaterio returned to Intramuros, they were surprised to see the Mindanao Beatas there. The end of the Spanish colonial rule and its patronato real meant the freedom of the Beaterio of Mother Ignacia to live its true identity as a religious community willed by God to be at the service of the mission of the church. The Beatas petitioned the Archbishop for the reorganization of the Beaterio and the return of the Jesuit spiritual direction. Approving both requests, the Archbishop recommended the revision of the constitutions to include provisions that would respond to the situation. With the permission to profess the vow of poverty, the dream of Mother Ignacia for the community to be recognized as a religious community was fulfilled. The first general congregation held in 1902 elected the first superior general, Mother Maria Efigenia Alvarez, and the members of her council. The revised constitutions were submitted to the archbishop with a request for assistance to have the Beatelio recognized as a congregation by the Holy See. The congregation was canonically erected on July 31, 1906, and received the decree of praise from Pope Pius X on March 17, 1907. This was the first recognition by the Holy See of the religious community founded by Mother Ignatia. The sisters complied with the required reviews and revisions of the constitutions, and on March 24, 1931, the congregation received the decree of approbation from Pope Pius XI. From Beaterio de la Compañía de Jesús, the name was changed to Compañía de las Beatas de la Virgen María and to Congregación de Religiosas de la Virgen María in 1932. As the congregation was undergoing the process of becoming a pontifical institute, it continued to expand its apostolic endeavors. The missions in Mindanao were incorporated into the congregation's mission after the reorganization. Sisters were sent to the mission established before the Philippine Revolution, and new mission houses and schools were opened, not only in different parts of Mindanao, but also in Manila, Bulacan, Pampanga, Cavite, and Laguna. As the missions of the congregation expanded, the school of the Beaterio in Manila, which became known as the Colegio del Beaterio, was formally incorporated in 1912. The Colegio upgraded its facilities and curriculum. The name was changed to St. Mary's College in 1939. The elementary and secondary courses of the Beateria were formally recognized. The Junior Normal College was opened to prepare the sisters for the teaching apostolate. With the opening of new houses and schools from 1920 to 1930s, the congregation established itself and became known as a teaching congregation. 
It still continued its dormitory ministry, and by 1930, it had three dormitories, one in Cebu and two in Manila. The sisters continued the congregation's retreat apostolate and catechetical ministry. The Second World War posed another challenge to the congregation. Classes were suspended, schools were closed in Manila and different parts of the country. The sisters had to evacuate intramuros. This time, there would be no more possibility of returning. The buildings were razed to the ground during the liberation of Manila in 1945. The lot in Quezon City, which was acquired for the novitiate in 1939, became the new mother house of the congregation of the religious of the Virgin Mary. The sisters reopened the schools and accepted new missions from 1946 to 1948. Even with the needed repairs of school buildings and upgrading of facilities as well as financial constraints, the sisters managed to continue their apostolic works. On January 12, 1948, with the definitive approbation of its constitutions, the religious of the Virgin Mary received the distinction of being an apostolic institute of pontifical right. 200 years after the death of Mother Ignatia, the Beaterio she founded was officially recognized by the church as a community of religious women. The fourth historical period, 1948 to 2021. The RVMs at the service of mission in the native country and overseas. By the grace of God, the sisters were able to pursue their mission of evangelization despite the many challenges of the post-war era. As the congregation accepted new invitations to run schools in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, it also continued its retreat and dormitory apostolates and allowed sisters to work in the hospitals to care for the sick. The congregation kept abreast with the changing times and implemented the renewal called for by the Second Vatican Council. This meant another review and revision of the constitutions based on the original spirit of the foundation of Mother Ignacia del Spirito Santo, the scriptures and the teachings of the church, as well as the needs of the times. The sisters took to heart the spirit of the renewal of Vatican II, Besides retreat, education, and dormitory, the congregation organized and accepted new types of ministries. The social action ministry was organized in 1972. Later on, the different social action programs were integrated in the school's community involvement programs, even as the social ministry continues to have its own thrust. The congregation sent sisters to respond to the needs of the church through various forms of services in the seminary apostolate, catechetical centers of the diocese, bishops' residence in EAPI, CBCP, PMAS, finance office of the diocese, Cebu Caritas, archdiocesan archives, nunciatures, and teaching in schools of theology administrative work in the diocesan schools. These were grouped together as the special ministry of the congregation. The congregation also responded to the call to overseas mission. The first RVM missions outside the Philippines were opened in Sacramento, California in 1959, Honolulu, Hawaii in 1971, and Indonesia in 1977. Several mission houses were started in Papua New Guinea, Rome, and Ghana, West Africa. Other foundations include Islamabad, Pakistan, Canada, and Pangu Pangu, American Samoa, and Taiwan. From 2009 to 2020, 
New communities were established in Rome and Canada. Today, the RVM serve God in different fields of apostolate, schools, dormitories, retreats, seminaries, social ministry, formation, and special ministry in several parts of the Philippines, Indonesia, Taiwan, Ghana, West Africa, Rome, Canada, and the United States. We have a total of 83 communities in the Philippines located in 10 archdioceses and 19 dioceses. The RVM has 40 mission communities abroad in six countries, the USA, Canada, Indonesia, Ghana, West Africa, Italy, and Taiwan. The RVM ministries include education, retreat, dormitory, social ministry, special ministry, and seminary. Education is our main apostolate. Many of our schools are in the provinces and in small towns. Our sisters responded with courage to the bishop's request to manage parochial schools or to establish RVM schools. Our sisters knew of a time when they had to make both ends meet to keep the school going despite meager resources. To date, we still have poor schools, but we managed to help one another to continue providing holistic education through efficient administration, updated curriculum centered on Christian living, family spirit among faculty, staff, and personnel, an Ignatian Marian culture based on the core values of faith, excellence, and service, and their related values. We have alumni who became religious and priests, and lay people who excel in their field and live the values of Mother Ignatia in their families and workplaces. Before the pandemic struck, we have an average of 65,000 students per year and approximately 16,300 personnel and staff. The RVM Religious Education Institute under the RVM Education Ministry offers certificate program in religious studies, a master's degree program in religious education and master in pastoral ministry program for RVM sisters and lay faculty. The RVM Education Ministry Commission recently conducted a study on the impact of the quality transformative Ignatian Marian education on the lives of students and graduates, a blend of post-positivist and constructivist views. The following is the result of that study. The Catholic Education Framework Quality Transformative Ignatian Marian Education, designed by the religious of the Virgin Mary, has created a distinct mark on the present lives of their graduates and students. Their high extent of manifestation of the core values of faith, excellence, and service, and their high level of attribution of these values to quality time are validations of the relevance of the Catholic-based curriculum in molding the character of the young people. Graduates, as compared to the students, have manifested better the values of faith and service and have reported also a higher degree of attribution of these traits to the RVM Transformative Ignatian Marian Education. Sex, age, and course of the graduates were not the associating factors in the manifestation and attribution of such values. Essential themes extracted from the graduates' and students' experiences of the quality time were the inculcation of holistic interpersonal and intrapersonal values, provision of strong personal and Christian foundation for human interactions, and the realization of compassion resilience, and joy in the difficult moments of their lives. Further, 
The experiences of the students on the transformative Ignatian Marian education have evidently shaped their beliefs, attitudes, character, and commitment, embracing the virtues of faithfulness, nobility, humility, and service. The RVM sisters also serve through the dormitory and retreat apostolate and are strengthening their social and pastoral ministries. In our dormitory apostolate, we provide a home away from home to female college students and professionals. We witness the Marian hospitality, accompany our young people with love and compassion, and carry out an evangelization program to nurture their faith and help them grow as mature Christians. The retreat ministry continued to be part of the apostolic endeavors of the congregation. Our schools provide time for administrators, faculty, staff, and graduating students to have annual retreats for three days and one day recollection for non-graduating students. The RVM house in Singalong became the first retreat house that was named Betania in 1940. In 1962, the retreat house was transferred to its present location in N. Domingo, Quezon City. Since an eight-day retreat using the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius is part of our RVM life and spirituality, our young sisters would give recollections to the students. As our sisters gain more confidence from their experience of the spiritual exercises and through training, they became more active in giving retreats to different groups. In the early 20th century, we had sisters who gave Lenten mission in parishes. The congregation took the initiative to send sisters to Jesuit centers of spirituality for training in retreat giving. As a result, our Bitania retreat houses not only provide a place for retreat, but are staffed with RVM retreat directresses who give both preach and directed retreats. The congregation also trained sisters for the roving retreat apostolate. With certified retreat directresses, the RVM retreat ministry offered periodic retreat facilitating seminars, not only to RVM sisters, but also to non-RVMs, priests and lay people, both men and women. The RVM social ministry has gone a long way from the first social action center in 1972. Through MINSA, Mother Ignacia Social Action Center, the RVMs continue to involve themselves in evangelization and social development programs to benefit the poor and marginalized. The congregation collaborates with the church and other agencies to address emerging realities. The RVM also has housing projects for the poor. Every now and then, there are RVM sisters who receive special charisms from God to serve in the prison ministry, women's desk, and to serve the indigenous peoples, and even reach out to seafarers. The RVM social ministry also links with our schools in offering technical training program and vocational technology. Through the special ministry, the congregation serves in various capacities according to the needs of the church. In addition to what have already been mentioned, it is worth noting that RVM sisters also helped in the formation of the Yosesan congregations in the Philippines and in Ghana, West Africa. We know of three sisters who were assigned as guide and formator of newly formed groups in response to the request of the bishop. In 1996, the Mother Ignatius Center for Spirituality was established with a more general focus on the religious and spiritual development of women through a holistic approach. The center was run by a directress assisted by a staff of sisters with training in formation, midlife directions, and theology. Mix offered seminars and workshop for the continuing formation of RVM sisters. In consultation and coordination with the local ordinaries, the center established a training program for formators of local diocesan congregations to respond to the call of Vita Consecrata that the more established congregations assist the developing local congregations. 
this effort is very much aligned with the spirit of Mother Ignacia. The program was given in two phases. There were five groups that availed of the program from 1996 to 2007. The growth of the Beaterio into a congregation and its response to the apostolic challenges of the times showed the vitality of the spirit of Mother Ignacia. Indeed, her love continues to shine as her daughters courageously strive to respond with zeal to the call of mission in different contexts. The story of the congregation that has grown from the small Beaterio of Mother Ignacia continues to unfold. It bears witness to the enduring vitality and strength of the foundation, the spirituality of Mother Ignacia. The lamp she lit to guide the path of native women aspiring to their religious life and the maturity of faith continues to shine. It remains undeemed. I am Sister Maria Anisha Ko of the Religious of the Virgin Mary. We are here in the Heritage Hall of the RVM Archives in N. Domingo, Quezon City. I hope that you will have the opportunity to visit this place and learn more of the foundation and spiritual legacy of our beloved foundress, Mother Ignacia del Spiritu Santo. Praise the Jesus and Mary. <laughs>